Do you remember reading in the press um, a couple of weeks ago um, Lee Kuan Yew? Uh, so from 1959 to 1990 was the first Prime Minister of Singapore. And uh, the article referred to a statement that he made in, in the 1980s and it was about challenging Australia who he felt at the time was at risk of becoming the poor white trash of Asia. So part of my presentation this afternoon is about that provocative question of it wasn't so much about the financial sector for which Singapore became well known, it's about the grains industry. Are we at risk of becoming the poor white trash of Asia? AGIC was formed in 2012. It was, a, it was the brainchild of GRDC, Grains Research and Development Corporation, and the WA Department of Agriculture. And it largely fell out of post deregulation of the AWB uh, effectively disappearing. And who was going to do the post farm gate stuff, if you like, that looked at uh, after farm quality? Uh, development and then a lot of the research work that was going on. GRDC invest uh, in excess of 150, 160 million dollars in pre-farm gate, but who does the work post-farm gate? So over the five years, which will conclude in uh, it was 2012 to 2017, the five years, it's an investment of 20 million dollars each, a total of 40 million dollars. And AGIC is in the middle of a review at the moment, which is the halfway point. And that review is looking at a whole raft of issues, including of does it deliver on its, on its original mandate and should AGIC continue past the original brainchild, which was two five-year um, five uh, segments. It sounds a little bit self-serving to say absolutely it should, but what I'm about to take you through is some of the threat that Australia is currently under uh, and perhaps conjure some of the questions and some of the solutions to fix those. It is based in, in Western Australia. It's on the Department of Agriculture precinct in South Perth. Um, and it's very much connected to agriculture. It's whilst our, whilst our base is Western Australia, we've, we're about to put uh, a resource into Canberra here, but it's about ensuring that we have strong connection Australia-wide. This um, demonstrates that we've got two major research portfolios. One's in wheat functionality and barley functionality and the other one's, this top one here, is, is in strategic market intelligence. Around the outside is economic analysis, business development, a, a large wheat laboratory, a large barley laboratory, a communications team of three or four and a very small finance team. I don't need to tell you about Australia's wheat production because we, it's all through this, these, uh, these two days. I want to draw your attention to Indonesia specifically because I want to talk about that uh, in, the, in the next couple of slides and about how our exports have taken a hit uh, because of the encroaching uh, mechanisms, if you like, of, of Canada particularly. So Australia is renowned for quality, wheat grown and clean green environment, but it's not enough to maintain our market share. You heard Andrew Forrest talk about clean, green, um, safe, uh, and it's something that Australia really needs to, to have, not only now, but carried forward in the future. But is that really what's going to cut the mustard, or do we need to do something different? Indonesia is, uh, is Australia's largest wheat trading partner. It's valued at a lot of money. Uh, and as Andy Crane mentioned, in, it's the CBH group in joint partnership has invested heavily uh, through, this, uh, through this network with the Salim group, also in Vietnam and so on. But the two red arrows here demonstrate clearly that there has been, if you look at the uh, green line here, which is Canada, has taken a, a dip upwards in terms of imports into Indonesia. And you'll see the red line, which is the Australian exports or Australian imports, has taken a dip down. We recently had a team working in SIGI, C-I-G-I, I can never remember what it stands for, but it's something like Canadian Institute of Grain something or other. Uh, Canadian uh, Grain Commission, it's all connected. And what they're doing is that they're trying to understand, not only from a barley perspective, but more so from a wheat perspective, what is it that the Canadian grain needs to be like 
so that it's able to uh, gain entree and also eventually dominate the Southeast Asian noodle market. This is where it's heading. We feel that the CWRS, the Canadian wheats, are ideally suited to Southeast Asian. I'm going to show you some photographs in a moment that just demonstrates that we bring these Asian teams not only out of uh, Indonesia but Vietnam and, and the Philippines to our laboratories to teach them how to, to do, how to work with Australian wheats for Asian baking, but it's not enough. So what we see is that the Canadians doing a lot of work around the sensory evaluation of noodles using some really, really sophisticated technology so that at the front end of grading and development and their genetics, they're able to predict down the back end about the capacity to deliver on the consumer sensory needs, if you like, of the future. Of course, new origin impo imports, India, Ukraine and Russia is rising and I'll speak about those in a moment. Another really big opportunity is the deregulation of the Japanese buying processes where there was a pretty much a single door of entry to Japan where tenders went out, you made, a, you made an offer to the tender process and then that was sold on through the Japanese market. And you can see here our current share of the pie in a wheat sense is a million, is a million tonnes. But the deregulation provides for major increases, major potential increases. But to be able to do that, it means that you've got to have, as in my work through Loop and Foods Australia, you need presence, 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 and they're all spelt a little bit differently. It's about being there, about being seen, it's about understanding uh, what is it about the functionality of Australia's grain that delivers on the highly sophisticated sensory needs of the Japanese people. It's not enough to rest on the laurels of the past. It's really about trying to ensure that we've got potential to extend uh, our technical capacity into those Japanese noodle manufacturers in a deregulated market. So there's another five million tonnes of wheat up for grabs. We recently had the executive officer for the Philippine Association of Flour Millers. I can never remember. There's a big long acronym about this long, but it's they represent about 42 or 43 per cent of the entire Philippine milling industry. So the Philippine milling industry is it's, it's quite large. It's 2.2 million tonnes of wheat, but Australia exports generally less than 200,000. All of that goes in in the container market, and all of it pretty much goes into the stock feed market. You would say, why is that? Do you remember in 1945 when MacArthur said, I'll be back? Well, he never left, because what he did was he took DNS out of the US and a sponge and dough baking system that never left the Philippines. So you've got a very concentrated Philippine milling market and a very decentralised SME baking, it's the mums and dads market, where that extension, that, the capacity to get that extension of, guess what, there's a new wheat on the block and this is how you use it, is extremely difficult. DNS is very high in protein, very strong in gluten. You need a lot of energy to really be able to work it, and that's the way we do things around here. But when you actually talk about the softer, whiter wheats of Australia, even though Australian wheats are significantly cheaper than DNS, the freight costs are significantly cheaper, guess what? They now pay for power, like many SMEs around the world for years have always pinched a little bit of power, for one way or another. They're now paying for power, the kids are coming home from school with their MBAs saying, Dad, we're really struggling with our capacity to be able to have great expertise in our business, reduce our failures, rationalise our energy costs and so on. We really need to do it a different way. So is this an opportunity that Australia should go and grab against the likes of the US? I'll talk about some of the challenges of that in a moment. So here's the, here's the model, if you like, or here's the detail around Australia. So it's very, very small. You can see how it's changed over the time. The new kids on the block, of course, uh, Russia. We had uh, at the uh, crop updates in Perth last week, we had a fellow called Dimitri, um, many, many letters, um, spoke, about, uh, spoke about Russia and about how Russia is intending to become, again, a major force on the wheat market. So 30 million tonnes potential increase uh, and is that going to come out of the Black Sea? Quite potentially, yes. What about the Ukraine? 
uh, where's the potential for Ukraine? Massive investment going into the Ukraine. In fact, we were to put a team in there very recently to be able to understand a lot of the detail around what does Australia need to do to be able to compete with the Ukraine. But of course, they got a little bit twitchy when I said you've got to go towards the east border as well. So we've decided to stay away from there. But I think it's clear that the Ukraine is a looming uh, opportunity. Um, and as I put up here, the Black Sea is not that far from Asia. And guess what? It's that soft white wheat where it comes from, Australia. Uh, Barnaby Joyce spoke about Durham wheat. Well, there's not that much Durham wheat grown in Australia. Uh, the vast majority of wheat grown in Australia matches what the Ukraine supply. So you would think that Australia has to be really sharp and understand what it is that our customers, their consumers, need to ensure that we are able to match demand to supply. Have a look at this. So in a short time from 2002 through to today, you can see the encroaching of the Black Sea exports and it's going to continue. If you think about some of the opportunities for Australia, all right, so we've got the Ukraine. Did you know that the Balkans this year were in a, an export surplus position of 13 million tonnes of wheat? Who's heard of the Balkans exporting 13 million tonnes of wheat? And guess what? It's all around 15% protein, 14, 15% protein. And the world markets pay more for protein. So who's heard of the Balkans? So there are other emerging countries which I'll talk about shortly. Let's just talk about the Philippines for a moment and, and Australia as a market entry strategy. So the Philippines is a large opportunity to uplift Australia's value from, for example, an APW, general middle of the road wheat, up into those values that DNS provides. So let's go for it. So what do we do? We gradually change, we, we create a shift in the way that DNS, the American wheats, the high protein wheats that I spoke about, and the sponge and dough systems, we shift them over to our instant or our quick time doughs because we've got those lovely white wheats that don't need so much energy and they're quicker to make and so on and so forth. Guess what we open the door to? The Black Sea. So we've got to be very cautious about shifting these heavily dominated US Canadian markets over to those markets that could work with a soft white wheat market because potentially all we're doing is opening ourselves to competition from the Black Sea. All right, so I've spoken about the Canadian, there it is there, Canadian International Grains Institute. So, ooh. So with an annual budget of about $10 million, they do roam the globe and they do exactly what I was talking about doing with those Filipinos or the Indonesians or the Vietnamese. And it's about doing that technical extension work, presence, presence, presence. It's really about them understanding what they've got to do to be able to adopt a better profit model, if you like, but without sacrificing consumer preference, uh, consumer evaluation. So they're tailored, large-scale customer technical support, quality data. When the Canadians and the US arrive in the Philippines, they take with them a pack of about 250 to 300 pages of technical data. It's not about uh, protein content, moisture, and so on. It goes further than that. It talks about what are the settings in my mill, in my manufacturing, that I need to be able to adopt so I don't sacrifice my consumer um, sensitivities. I need to know that because from year to year, uh, the segregations within Canada shifts as it does in Australia. APW or Durham or ASW, it's never the same from one year to the next. It shifts. So when you do all of that extensibility and dough testing and noodle manufacturing from one year to the next, when you arrive on your customer's doorstep and you talk to them about that, they get it because they've got less wastage, they've got lower, lower energy, they've got better utilisation, better productivity, and they're able to preserve their consumer sensitivities and all those issues that ensure that they're able to turn a dollar. That's what the Canadians do very, very well. What does Australia do? Not very much. Let's talk about the US Wheat Associates. So, similar, 
but they've got about 17 million. We won't get into how they're funded, but it's not that different to the way they're, they're funded fairly similarly uh, between the Canadians and the US. $17 million, and they pretty much, and that's pretty much an annual fee, where their teams again turn up with those 300 page books and say, get over here, and this is how you use our product. And by the way, here's some air tickets to bring your staff over into the US or Canada, Winnipeg, wherever it is, and we are going to teach you how to use our grain in every single one of your products. What happens then? Well, there's a heartfelt chemical connection that says, wow, I get it. Don in the US or Jack in, the, in, in uh, Winnipeg said, this is the best thing, and if I hit a problem, I've only got to get on the phone and he'll fly out here and he'll solve it for me. And guess what, Dad? I think we're probably going to be able to turn a two million US dollar profit more because we've got it right. What do you think? Well, what do you think happens? That's what happens. US Wheat Associates is a little bit different to Siggy where they get very much involved with the trading and the, and the values and, and the reporting. I'm not proposing that at all. What we're saying is that we've got the Canadians and the US out there with these 350 page documents that tell the market how to get the best profitability by using their profit, by, by using their product. So that's where the US and the US Wheat Associates uh, have offices uh, globally. Value versus price. I thought this might give you some feeling, even though I apologise, it's a little bit small for those that are up the back there. But value versus price. So down the far end here, we've got India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, North Korea, uh, feed market. More likely to look for lowest price wheat. Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, Chile, Thailand, Guatemala, Singapore, China, getting higher and higher, Japan, Korea uh, and Taiwan. So what we've got is that we've got a whole spectrum of wheats. Wheat's not wheat. It's not like oils ain't oil salt. Wheats are not wheat, They're, as everyone knows. But the difficulty is how you extend not exactly the same technical uh, work to, to one country. You've got to be able to do it in a very, very comprehensive way. This is where the risk is to Australia. If we don't do this, we will get smashed. So it's only one day, we're only, what, we, what are we, a bit over halfway through the first day and I haven't heard the word innovation too much yet. I've heard a lot about R&D, I haven't heard too much about extension, but I haven't heard too much about innovation. Every now and then the word innovation pops up and it's about Innovation Australia and here and no sooner does the headline go up that it drops down again. So Australia is extremely good at doing a hell of a lot with not much resources, so this is where the opportunity is. So this is a photograph that looks at increasing the ratio of Australian wheat in Southeast Asian market baking trends. So we're doing a little bit of this. We're trying to partner up with other groups to be able to bring these teams out here that are not only in the procurement team, but they're also in those that make the decisions about high productivity without, without um, risk of their consumer um, sensitivities, to bring them out and explain, so what can you do with Australian with, what, with Australian breads. We're doing some work, again post Farmgate, in looking at the genetics where, you know, this highly sophisticated um, uh, protein and molecular biology enables us to understand what does the DNA need to look like so that you get these amazing breads. If we know what the DNA should look like, surely all we've got to do is implant that in our R&D programs and guess what, it gives us a competitive strategic advantage globally, doesn't it? You'd think so. Well, the path to market used to be 15 years, John. It's now about seven or eight years. It's still a long way. How quickly do you think the world markets shift these days? Do you think we've got 15 years? Do you think we've got eight years? It's a really big challenge. It's a combination not only of genetics, but it's about technology to be able to fill that gap between when genetics caps, catches up. They tell me that on the odd occasion when you malt beer, you get this off flavour. I think all beer smells nice. But there's this thing called dimethyl sulf, I can never remember the O, DMSO, but it's about understanding, uh, it's about understanding this off flavouring gene. In other words, going back to the genetics again that enable us to solve the problem in country of getting that off flavour. So how do we, how do we ameliorate that flavour so that, so that the appeal of Australian barley increases? We've read a lot, perhaps, you, perhaps you've read a lot, about China recently 
uh, buying huge amounts of barley and it's been pretty much FAQ barley, fair to average quality barley. Do you know that China is also one of the world's largest exporters of malt? It's not about buying FAQ or very average quality barley, malting it and then exporting that globally. It's not about that at all. It's high quality malt. What about China? Well, China, China's beer consumption is increasing dramatically. Does China have that sophisticated taste, if you like, about understanding which beer I actually like? Do I like a pale ale? Do I like a lager? Etc. Are they really that sophisticated yet? No, they're not. Does that mean that there's an opportunity for the way that Australian beer is malted and then brewed? The answer is yes. Are we doing enough to extend that, uh, that education, that technical support and so on to China so that when they look for a malting barley that gives them the best opportunity to capture market, are we out there? A little bit, yes. But enough? Probably no. Oats, <coughs> don't know about you, but I eat oats. I have porridge most mornings, but I always mix it with a little bit of lupin, um, only because that's my history. Uh, and uh, we're doing some work in, in China now with oats. So there's a real resurgent uh, within China of oats as a, as a health food. So there's an organisation called CMILD. We're also working with a large state administration of grain, ASAG, to try to develop that stronger relationship. And we've got groups coming over from time to time really trying to understand what it is that they've got to do to be able to connect with the Australian grains industry for these markets. And we buddied up with Curtin University, as you can see the logo there. A little while ago, uh, there was a joint venture with the uh, Department of Agriculture and Edith Cowan University. There's a fantastic pilot malting facility up there. So when you malt barley, you normally malt it in 150 tonne batches. But it's too late when you've malted the barley and you get it wrong. So what we've now got is that we've got the capacity to pull through new varieties of barley in 30 kilo batches to predict accurately what will happen in 150 tonne batches. So what that enables us, the market to do is to effectively get to market quicker. It's a, it's a serious investment. It's actually a little bit short on capacity. It really needs to be increased. But the next step, it's not just about pilot malting. It's also about pilot brewing. Because when we talk about the Chinese market, we not only want to bring them to Australia to show them how to use Australian malting uh, barley varieties to make great beer, we also want to teach them how to make great beer. We also want to be able to educate them about the sophistication between a pale ale and, a, um, and another, one of the many other brewers that we, brews that we make. We want to be able to talk to them about how to tweak, how to, be able to, how to be able to use control systems in a more sophisticated way so that they achieve that profitability level. They're able to deliver on consumer expectation. They're able to innovate with support from really experienced, uh, highly technical um, teams. One of the other things that we do a little bit of, and speaking to the Bureau of Met guys out here today, uh, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to work with teams around Australia because there's better opportunity to work as teams rather than the disparate groups that we've got at the moment, to be able to forecast medium to longer term about what's the setup of the season. In my early days, I used to be a supervisor for CBH, and I was appointed to a small, how long have I got, John? A couple of minutes. Right on the money. A small place and I had 30 people there. 30 people lived in the town. And on numerous occasions, it was a little place called Muck and Budden. It was the end of the railway line. Um, and in that location, very often was the time when, uh, when Johnny Marafiori, for example, would leave his equipment in the shed, would not plant a grain. And I'm sure those of you who have been through drought have done exactly the same thing. Wouldn't it be good if we could predict with a greater level of certainty that that was going to happen? Not only would a farmer save money in terms of setup costs or being able to set up according to what the season was looking like, not only would the grain storage and handlers provide for resources according to the season, what about logistics, what about shipping and so on and so forth? Wouldn't there be major strategic advantages? So we're not there yet, but there's huge opportunity for do it. It's very sophisticated. Uh, and it needs innovation, um, but uh, I think that there's huge potential. So if I were king for a day, I'm going to finish up with this slide, or the second last slide, John, so you can stop sweating. I think that we need Team Australia. We took Lupin Foods Australia to Gulf Food and did really, really well with it. 
but we were a tiny little one metre by one metre square trying to cook falafel and so on. When we went to Dairy Australia or we went to Beef Australia, or MLA and all the rest of it, we were spread out all over the shop. So when it comes to grains, we're no different. I think we need Team Australia. We need a common face that says, that pulls that brand through that Andrew Forrest talks about. We need to be able to calibrate. I talked about the seasonal outcomes. How do you predict that sort of stuff? Well, it's all very good and well to make the predictions, but unless you can get the actual data to calibrate that prediction, you don't know what your standard error of prediction or how good you are at doing it. And the trouble is, at the moment, it's extremely difficult because of a lack of trust, a lack of technolo technological data acquisition. There's a real problem with those, the disconnect of those two things, the prediction and what actually happens. We could pull those together. You can calibrate it far more accurately. Uh, I feel that success is only a blink of an eye away. Val the case for value-adding. I've written an article which will be released in the next couple of days, and it's about the case for value-add. Why do we continue to export commodities from Australia? Why aren't we doing, why aren't we doing more work with value-adding? And hats off to CBH for pursuing Loop and Foods Australia. <laughs> Customer value in increases, so moving the DNSs over to Australian wheats I've spoken about. Let's get back into marketing, not order taking, um, and let's connect Australia to its own food, grain food safety, a unique strategic advantage. Is it that Australia will constantly be able to hold this thing about being clean and green? When's the next chemical residue scare going to happen? What happens when the Black Sea starts to export significantly? What will the mycotoxin levels be? And there have already been examples where this has killed people. Are there other chemical residue issues that are starting to develop that we're not taking any notice of? I just wonder. We're going to Singapore for Global Grains Asia. We'll be up there. We've actually got a booth and we pulled about 15 or 20 uh, grain companies in there. If you're up there, please come and visit us. Thanks.